Hello and welcome to this series of courses um, organized by Brad and particular by Chris Udry, Mark Rosenzweig and Pascal and Jupa on, on behalf of Brad. Uh, today I'm going to speak about how well do credit markets work and why some theory, some evidence on that. So if you sort of, I think that this, this is something that's surely familiar, which is that, uh, you know, what, what we define to be a properly functioning capital market is one where the interest rate or maybe the expected interest rate because some you're allowed to default is, is a constant, meaning you can borrow as much as you want, as long as uh, that, uh, you, you pay that, you commit to paying that interest rate, there might be a known default probability or at least a, uh, an expected default probability, but, you know, and the interest rate will be adjusted for that. You know, if you're going to default 20% of the time, you are better pay me extra for those, but nonetheless, it's basically uh, a, a linear uh, supply function. You can borrow as much as you want at that price. The, that goes with yet another assumption, which is that the interest rate paid to depositors is actually more or less equal to that number. So the expected, uh, what you pay in expectation to the, to uh, what the borrower pays in expectation to the bank is roughly equal to the what the bank pays in expectation to the depositors. Uh, and if that's the case, then the third premise follows, which is that the inter interest rate faced by savers, that is the people who put money in the bank, uh, is in, ex in ex ex the expected interest rate, uh, uh, maybe, is, e is equal to the uh, to the uh, marginal product of capital because you know the inter depositors are basically paid the expected interest rate that the borrowers pay and the borrowers equa equate the marginal product to that because they are they are profit maximizers and therefore as long as the marginal product is higher than the inter expected interest rate, interest rate they borrow more so that's so that's that's then delivers this uh, i think key a prediction that efficient, uh, efficient capital allocation uh, is generated by equalizing the marginal products of capital and that the market drives you there. Now, is that true? So I'm going to go quickly. There's much more evidence of this kind available, for example, in one of the, uh, one of the references in the reading list, uh, the one on I think contracting constraints, etc. Piece I wrote many years ago for the handbook, handbook uh, the Economic Society, uh, you know, five yearly volumes. So this is this is a this is a uh, f from you know just a, a, a little. Uh, I picked out a few of them. This is from a. a a large survey for a period for 10 years. This is a repeated survey in all India rural credit survey. And it's old, but it has the advantage of being large. And the average rate is um, then these these are these are now averages for large populations. So this this I will point out later that the average is is not particularly the most useful number. So different people face different interest rates, but at least the average was all paid by borrowers was something like 15 to 18 uh, percent. The bond rate or the bank deposit rate were comparable. They were three percent. So this is the the savers got three percent and the borrowers paid 18 percent. So that, that's a that's a measure of the gap between those numbers. The number those remember those numbers mostly are expected to be the same. Uh, there's a question of default because, uh, you know, maybe uh, there's default, but I'll argue later that that's not really a much of an issue either. So those rates are not, not equalized. And the same is true of, of another study somewhat later um, 
from, from a later period, very, uh, again, uh, one study that I'll come back to, these are money lenders in, uh, in uh, rural, semi-urban Pakistan. And uh, the interest rate they were charging were, was close to 80%. The, the rate at which they were borrowing, these money lenders were borrowing, so they were taking deposits or taking loans from others was 30%. Again, those numbers were by no means uh, equalized. So the, the, the lending rate and the borrowing rate are very different. The second uh, fact, which is I already alluded to, is that it's, and the mean is not very useful. So Alim, the same study of the Pakistani money lenders actually gives the standard deviation as well. The mean was 78%, but the standard deviation was 38% of the interest rate people were paying. That means that something between, if you just think of that as being a, 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 you know, a Gaussian distribution and you look for two standard deviations away from the mean, two standard deviations from the mean is about 2% to 150 plus percent. So that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's not a unusual, uh, that's not an unusual experience. And this is not just a matter of South, A South Asia. It's not that we in South Asia are particularly uh, bad in, in running credit markets. It's uh, also the true in Thailand, the interest rate where, where two to 3% per month um, in the central plain, but five to 7% in the North and the Northeast. So interest rates were very different. And these are per month. So 7% per month, is a hugely uh, more than 5% per month because you compound it over month to month. One goes from like 80% to 100 and something, 20% or something. So that's, those, are, those are numbers that should make you worry that you know, somehow people are not paying the same interest rate. It's, all, it's also, so this, there's a study again from, from Punjab uh, where they find that the mean interest rates were for 35% for people who own land, but 81% for those who don't. And finally, in Kenya and Zimbabwe, uh, the, the business, the trading group paid 2.5% per month, but the rest of the population who in both places were, were black were paid 5%. So that was uh, per month. So those are huge, huge interest rate differences between different people. So in other words, the idea that everybody faces the same interest rate and can borrow at that as much as they want at the interest rate doesn't seem to be true. And that interest rate doesn't seem to be equal to the interest rate that you know, the, lend, the, the lenders to the bank, the, the, if you like, the depositors get. Uh, now, this could be explained by default. Of course, if I have a very high rate of default and someone else has a very low rate of default will pay different interest rates. But turns out the default is very rare. In equilibrium, I mean, it's not because of, I'm going to argue this, it's not accidental. People make sure that people don't default. But, you know, the measures to the extent, this, this is a, a nice, again, a report of many different, uh, different uh, informal credit markets in India. And this report finds that, you know, default explains uh, of the total interest costs. So if you think of the, you know, how, how much it costs for me to lend to someone, um, you know, 14% is a high number, 3% is a low number. So in other words, it really isn't a big part of my, you know, if I'm lending at 80% per year, uh, this, and, you know, whatever my costs are, either I'm making a lot of money, or even, even if I'm actually, my costs are close to 80%, 3% of 80% is just not a lot of money. So it's not going to make a very big difference. Another way to think about it is use the, uh, the Aleem Pakistan data. And there again, the median default rate for every lender is between 1.5 and 2%. And the maximum was 10%. So just none of these people face a lot of default. There's not, there isn't much a lot of default and therefore, it is not the case that the reason why the interest rates are so high is primarily is, and so variable is primarily because of default. It's not because they are people are uh, not going to pay these interest rates. Some people and most people have very low rates of default. So when I pay uh, 
you know, 5% per month and someone else pays 7%, we're not going to have very different default rates, but our interest rates will be very different. All of this could be a result of monopoly. And I, 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 this is an area where I feel wish there, is, there would be more research because I'm not entirely convinced of what I'm saying, but the ex ante standard measures, the lots of lenders, the Alim's study again, where you remember I, I said uh, it's the, you know, the, the interest rate was 80%, the cost of capital was 30% and the, there was almost no default. Uh, 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 you know, in that he calculates also how much profits these people make because they have to spend time sitting in their shops waiting for the people to come and borrow to prepay, etc. And then if you value their time at reasonable prices, they don't actually make a lot of money. So in other words, it's not doesn't look like a result of monopoly rents. It's not that they're making tons of money. And this is this is a this is echoed by many other people. The, another possible uh, hypothesis you might have is that these interest rates are somehow misleading because it's the interest rate you pay in extremis, in, in situations where you really have no choice, you, you, uh, you, you, you wake up in the night and find that you are, you are getting a heart attack and you need a loan from somebody to pay for the hospital. And then you pay any interest rate. In a sense, it doesn't matter. You, you, your life is much more important. And at that point, you need money. This is not what drives these high interest rates. These high interest rates are, they are from people who are borrowing time after time. I mean, there's this uh, very nice study by Mulenathan, um, Kalan Mulenathan, and, and Roth, I think. Um, um, which is basically, again, goes back to this question. And it looks in more very recent, or in the 2000s, uh, uh, fruit sellers in Chennai, in India, and they seem to have a daily, uh, they, they seem to borrow um, basically a thousand rupees worth of fruits and pay back uh, sorry, 950 rupees were worth of fruits and pay back a thousand rupees at the end of the day. That's 50 rupees per day out on a base of uh, a thousand. That's close to 5%, but that's astronomical number. That's a, you, you know, you can't even, it's in the millions of, of percent. So that's that, that kind of rates people pay and they do this every day. What is nice about the study is they show that the, every morning the same thing happens. So these are not because people are, uh, are doing this once in their life. The last point I want to make is that there is a clear bias for the rich. So the rich get to borrow more and they pay, they pay lower interest rates. Rich, when they get, if you, you the richer people get uh, borrow more and those loans have a lower interest rate. So in other words, uh, the interest rate is much lower. For example, um, something like, uh, so in, from in, this, in this particular report, uh, the second lowest group, uh, poorest group pays 120% um, on average and the and that's variation within that. Some of them pay more and some pay less. And the richest pay 24%, so one fifth of that rate. So it, it really varies enormously by how much you can borrow. And the ones who can borrow at lower rates also seem to borrow, borrow more. So I'm gonna stop here and uh, see if there are any questions. Um, we have no questions so far. Okay, so I'll go ahead and then we'll will come, oops, what am I doing? Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to try to suggest a story for why, why this is happening. And, uh, and just to make the point that it's not so surprising once you think of it in the right way. Uh, and I'm not going to insist that this is the right story. Indeed, I'll show you some evidence that make, may make you worry that the other things are happening, but let me, let me start with that. So take a model where low of loan payment, repayment. Let's say low loan repayment is imperfectly enforceable. So now you have an investment project, you 
invest K dollars, you get F of K dollars back. And uh, the gross interest rate that you, uh, that you uh, pay is, um, is R. Um, the gross meaning, think of it as being, uh, instead of think of a one plus the interest rate, just call that the whole thing an interest rate. So I borrow $1, I pay, I repay $1 and 20 cents, the gross interest rate there is 120%. Um, so that's including principal and, and uh, interest. Borrower has a wealth of W and invests K, will need to borrow the difference. And he and at the end of the period, he's supposed to repay K, K minus W times R. Now, uh, imagine that there is a, he has an option of basically cheating the borrower. So he can, you know, the lender. So what he can do is he can, for example, uh, this is sometimes called, uh, one thing that people often do is sometimes called asset stripping, is that they, they uh, borrow, buy something with it, and then resell it. And so you, you know, and at the, by the time you show up to collect, they don't have anything, what can you collect? They have already resold the, resold the, or they've hidden it, or so they, they have claimed that it's broken. And in fact, they have just, you know, they broke, so they already bought something broken. So there are different ways in which you can maybe uh, refuse to pay. You can just refuse to pay also. And uh, the co this, that's costly, and call that cost uh, eta. Finally, let's use the notation rho to represent the cost of capital. The cost of capital is what the lender needs to get back to break even. So if I borrowed um, uh, a certain amount, then per, per dollar of that, uh, of the investment per, per dollar of if it's a, I make a bigger investment, it's more costly for me to hide it, you know, it's, uh, and therefore the cost goes up in proportion to the cost of investment. So, it, uh, so that gives me the following incentive constraint. When would you repay? Well, you're going to re repay if your net profit from that transaction, F of K minus the, after you repay, which is R, you repay R times K minus W is bigger than F of K minus eta K, which is the amount you uh, amount you uh, would uh, have if you instead you decided to cheat and and just steal the money. Now the reason why banks don't want that to happen is that while you it's costly for you to you know steal the money, it's or whatever hide the money or refuse to repay, it's uh, once you do it, the bank gets nothing. So the bank really doesn't want that to happen. So it sets the interest rate so that you are, uh, or the loan size, so that you given the interest rate, so that you don't want to do that. That's the, that's the incentive constraint. You see that F of K cancels, and then you rearrange those terms, you get that uh, simple equation, the maximum amount of investment you will be allowed to do that is to say I'll, by lending you the difference i'm going to allow you to do it has to be equal to that ratio uh, r over r minus eta which i'm going to call lambda mm. they, they this is just saying that firms are not allowed to borrow as much as they want because uh, the amount you borrow if you borrow more your your incentives are too distorted you you're going to almost surely want to run away with it. And so I'm going to limit the amount and that way you have a lot of skin in the game. You, you know, if K minus W is small relative to W, then you have a lot to lose by cheating. And that's, that's the reason why uh, you're going to repay. So uh, notice that this has the nice property uh, that you'd expect that when the interest rate goes up, uh, R over R minus eta uh, goes uh, when, uh, when R goes up, R, R over R minus eta goes down. Uh, and uh, that's exactly what you'd expect. As when R, and R goes to infinity, that ratio goes to one. That means that as the interest rate goes up, you are less able to 
uh, borrow as much. And again, that's consistent with this idea that you know the higher the interest rate, the more incentive you have to try to find a way to not repay. Now, in this model, this model does have the nice prediction that firms are credit ration; they don't borrow as much as they want. The amount and the amount you can borrow is increasing in the wealth. The richer people will be able to borrow borrow more, but since there's no default in equilibrium, the cost of capital, you know, the interest rate is, should be, if there's enough competition, should be equal to the cost of capital. Because, you know, I, while there's all these incentive problems, once I've solved the problems, then people will repay. Uh, they won't borrow as much as they would like to, and I would, in principle, like to lend them more, but I can't do it. But the, this, the, the logic of competition should still operate. It should still be the case that a firm, uh, if, I, if I'm making, I'm, you know, my cost of capital is 5% and I'm lending at 10%, somebody should come in and say, okay, well, um, you know, I'm going to pay more to your depositors or going to charge less to your uh, borrowers and, and take my business away. And so basically the interest rate should be equal to the cost of capital. And therefore, if the cost of capital is sort of given from outside the depositors bank rate or something, then in a sense that pins down the interest rate. So you don't see this key fact that we were trying to explain, which is that the interest rate varies a lot across people. Here, the interest rate won't vary, the amount you borrow will vary by with your wealth. Now, maybe uh, what we're missing here is the, is a, the fact that the borrowers, uh, you know, I'm, the borrowers eventually um, do repay. So one way to introduce that is that uh, if the lender doesn't take trouble, like, you know, takes the, uh, Alim uh, in his study describes a lot of the things lenders need to do. They need to visit the person, find out where he lives, find out what kind of business he has. So they need information about the borrower to make him repay. Uh, and if you don't have the information, then if you don't spend that cost, then that's then it's that's it. Uh, you you they won't repay. If you don't know where they live, you can't make them repay. For example, uh, so then maybe uh, there should be a monitoring cost in that story. And let's say the monitoring cost is linear in the amount you borrow. So just when you amount to borrow twice as much, you pay twice as much. So that's fee. There's a proportional cost of a proportion or the constant of proportionality. And now uh, for, the, for the bank to break even, it will need not only need to cover the cost of capital, so R times K minus W, which is its earnings, should be equal to rho times K minus W, which is its cost of capital, what it pays its depositors, plus phi times K minus W, which is, which is the amount of, uh, amount of, uh, of effort it puts into into getting the loan repaid, let's say. Uh, and so uh, that says R should be equal to phi plus uh, uh, rho, which, which gives you a reason why R may, may not be equal to rho. So the, the deposit rate and the interest rate will be different, which is something we observed, but not necessarily across people. But unless people are just, some people are harder to enforce, so phi is higher for them, the interest rate should be the same. So that still doesn't quite get us there. Now, I'm going to, the last model I'm going to talk about is one where the, the monitoring cost is a fixed cost. And that's extreme, meaning it doesn't depend on the size of the loan. It's clearly it's going to depend, you know, you do, do more de, de, due diligence when the loan is larger. So it's not the case that this is completely, but it, in some sense, it doesn't, matter. What matters is that there's a fixed cost part of it. And that I think is plausible that, you know, when, when you lend to someone, you have to do, even if you lend them very little, you need to find out where they live. And that's not an option. So even if you borrow, they're borrowing very little, they're going to, you need to find out where they live. You know, we need to find out how to make, the, you know, where, how to sort of, you know, what kind of assets they have. So if you want, they didn't repay, what could you try to get back? And so in some sense, there is still, there is still a, a, a fixed cost to be paid uh, where it doesn't depend on the size of the loan. Then you get this, the zero profit condition, the fact that the lender is breaking even gives you uh, this relation R times uh, the amount borrowed 
should be equal to the cost of capital, R, rho times k minus uh, w plus phi. Now, that, uh, th that uh, I want to combine that with the, what I had done before, which is that the, you know, going back to the borrower's incentive constraint, you get this relationship, which is that, you know, the borrower has, you have two ways of, of uh, the borrower has two ways of, of, you know, dealing with the fact that he's a loan. One is to default and pay eta k, and the other is uh, to just repay the loan. And uh, one costs r times k minus w, the other costs eta times k. Uh, so, the, and those need to be equal because if not, if uh, you know, you can either expand the loan if if uh, uh, the cost of you know if the interest interest cost is lower, or he will default. So those need to be equal, and that that gives us the equation r e, r times k minus w equals eta k. Now you plug that back into the previous one, and you get that equation rho times k minus w plus phi equals eta k. This can be rewritten uh, in the form that k is some function or now just rearranging terms, it's some function of, uh, of uh, of uh, sort of that, that ratio. Take that ratio and now you notice that that, that ratio is, uh, is uh, gives you a, 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 you know, once you subtract W from both sides of that, you get this uh, a function that uh, you get K minus W from that equation for K. Uh, and when you plug that into the for zero profit conditions, you get the equation at the bottom. You should, if you, if you are not convinced, you should, you can, you know, take a picture of this page and try that on a piece of paper, but it's, it's, really what two lines of algebra and you get you get that uh, equation r is equal to rho plus that term now what is important uh, what the point i want to make here is that this why did i insist on it well first thing it says that you know w enters the interest rate so people who and how does it enter well if eta minus w uh, eta w is close to phi, then R is going to be high. If the denominator is high, then the ratio is going to be, if the denominator is low, the ratio is going to be high and R will be high. So when R, eta W minus phi is close to zero, R is very high, who will that happen? Well, eta W will, is small when it's close to phi, when W is close to phi, uh, W is small. And so when W is small, R will be high. So poor people will pay high interest rates. Uh, if you go back to the, uh, the equation for K, you can see that that also says that when uh, rho W is close to phi, K will be small. So poor people will have small loans. Uh, this, these are not independent facts. In fact, they're related. And the, the story is the following. And another, maybe I observe one more thing before I make that point. If you think of the effect of fee, so some people are just a little harder to enforce. Well, when fee, when eta minus w is close to zero, eta w, so eta w minus fee is close to zero, then the effect of changing fee is huge because that's a ratio that's close to zero. Take a ratio that's, you know, one over, you know, if, if that number is like, uh, you know, one over hundred, and now I change fee by even uh, you know one one over five hundred. I'm going to change that ratio by quite a bit, and so that's that. That means that I'm going to have big effects. Changes in fee will have big effects on R. That all of that's algebra. Let me tell you why you should find that intuitive. So basically, the story is the following: When I let's say I increase W, when I increase W, you you get to borrow more. That was all, all, already true, even more true now. When you get to borrow more, remember that means that you're spreading your fixed cost across a bigger amount of, of lending. 
that means that the effect of the fixed cost of the interest rate is smaller. So the interest rate goes down. The interest rate goes down, then again, we know that low at, when the interest rate goes down, I said this a little while ago, then you can lend more to people. And if you can lend more to people, then K minus W goes up. That again means that, you know, the fixed cost is being spread across an even bigger amount. But that this virtuous cycle continues. So as W goes up, you get uh, a virtuous cycle, a multiplier, basically. An increase in W lowers the interest rate. A lowering of the interest rate increases the amount I can lend. Increasing the amount I can lend uh, lowers the interest rate because uh, the fixed cost is spread across a bigger amount. Lowering the interest rate makes me able to lend even more. And so there's a virtuous cycle. The virtuous cycle uh, of wealth uh, means that the interest rate could be a lot lower for somebody who is somewhat more wealthy. It could mean that uh, it also, the same logic operates. Uh, if, if, for example, fee is a, uh, eta is a little higher for some people, let's say, uh, then when eta is a little higher, then the interest rate will have to be, you know, uh, a, can be a little lower and uh, because, or I can, uh, I can lend a bit more because it's costly for me to default. Since uh, I, uh, I can lend you a bit more, then the interest rate can be a bit lower because it's the fixed cost being spread across a bigger amount. Since the interest rate can be a bit, bit lower, uh, the, uh, the amount I can lend to you is even a bit bigger, but then that drives the interest rate down because of the same logic of the fixed cost. And then I can lend you a bit more. So again, a virtuous cycle. So people who are a little better able to convince the lender that they will repay, the ETA is higher, uh, are going to have much lower interest rates. So this kind of virtuous cycle, what it does is it takes a small change and blows it up. And that, that's, that ex could explain why the interest rate varies a lot. And I, while I'm going to say in a minute that I think this may not be the whole story, I think it is a key under insight in this. When you think about credit markets, the reason why credit markets have these rather unstable outcomes, some people pay very low, some a lot, probably has a lot to do with the fixed cost of, of ensuring that the loan gets repaid. So that's summarizing what I was saying. It can explain a large wedge between the cost of capital and the interest rate and, and you know, uh, in effect, a very high monitoring cost per dollar lent. It can, um, it, the interest rate can be very sensitive to the cost of capital. Um, and uh, the interest rate will be especially sensitive is exactly for the people who get very small loans. But when you're very small loans, then a small change in the cost. So that's that's exactly when you get a very small loan. It's when uh, you know the uh, the uh, rho, 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 or rho minus uh, fee is small. But that those are exactly the kind of people who who are therefore whose interest rates are going to be very high, but it also means those are the, exactly the kind of people for whom a small change will really have a big multiplier because then they could borrow a little bit less more and then that's going to lower the interest rate then they're going to borrow a bit more. So that's the, all of these facts will turn out to be uh, con con correlated with each other. The, the most, uh, most uh, vulnerable borrowers will have the highest interest rates, the lowest loans, etc. It still doesn't explain why we do observe some amount of default, but I said I'm, I'm going to mostly think that default is relatively low. The reason why default is low is not because borrowers are necessarily, uh, you know, angels, as many of them I'm sure are, uh, but because uh, the lender is spending resources to make sure that the default doesn't happen. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I said many things and I'll uh, see if there are any questions. Yes, uh, we have a question from Francis. Uh, besides default rates, what can explain the large variation of interest rate? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Sorry. Uh, Besides default rates, what can explain the large variation well, I, I, of interest I, I, rates? I, I, I just tried to 
answer that question. So I'll repeat the answer I was, I was trying to suggest. So if it's a fixed cost of, of lending, then you have this multiplier property. Basically, I lend very little to you. So the interest rate uh, I have to, you have to pay to cover the fixed cost of monitoring you has to be very high. But then if the interest rate is very, very high, then you borrow very little and that reinforces, then again, the fixed cost becomes even more important in your transaction. And therefore, again, you have a very, uh, then I'm going to be even less willing to lend you a lot because the interest rate is high and your incentive to default is high. So I'm going to lend you even less and so on. So you get this uh, vicious cycle basically for very poor people. Uh, for richer people, you don't have it. And that, that explains why uh, small differences in wealth can have very big effects on the interest rate. Um, plus, if, if poor people are harder to you know, monitor, which might be true because they live in remoter areas or they live in you know, more marginal houses, so you can't, they live in a slum, so I don't know exactly where they live and all of those things become more difficult, then I think that, again, that itself has its own uh, vicious cycle. And that means why, that explains why poor people pay much higher interest rates. But the model, uh, the point of the model is to explain that. Thank you. We have another question now. What will be changed in the model if we consider repetitive borrowing? So you could, that's a great question. If you had repeat borrowing, you could try to uh, improve uh, the situation by saying, look, if you repay, then I'll give you another loan. So that, that sort of mitigates a bit the effect of the, of the, uh, you know, the, I don't have to provide as many, as much incentives directly. I could provide you with some incentives by saying, look, if you want a second loan, then you better repay the first one. Now, this, this is complicated because of course, as the loan gets bigger and bigger, uh, it, my incentive to default gets higher. So if people are really strategic, they could, they could just pretend to be good borrowers, you know, repay a few times and then default. And that's sort of been one worry that, uh, you know, the literature has dealt with. Uh, and uh, one answer is that, you know, not everybody's strategic. You, you, you know, in this process, you actually become, uh, you know, therefore repeat borrowing does have, has uh, benefits, but then, you know, it's not clear how exactly that works because you can see that, you know, I, if I'm really cynical, I have the incentive to pretend to be a good borrower, get a very big loan uh, at a low interest rate and then default on you. Uh, but the, I, I, this, this, is, this is a subject of, of uh, much, much, much debate. I, uh, but it, 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 I think the insight is right that repeat borrowing tends to mitigate it because there's an, another instrument for providing incentives. And it's in fact very relevant for what I want to say in a minute. Um, I think you can take just one more question. This is from Aranya. How high is the fraction of this fixed cost with respect to the total cost of lending in some of the real life examples? So, the, there's very little that uh, that is uh, is I've not seen someone do that exercise credibly. When I looked at that, it looked like it could be um, 70, 80 percent of the fix. For for very small loans, it could be 70, 80 percent of the cost of lending. But that's a, that was a back of the envelope and calculation I did with Alim's numbers. I think in the interest of time, we can proceed and take more questions at a later Thank point. You. So, what, so uh, I just told you a story of why the interest rates uh, can be high and variable, especially for poor people. Um, and I think now, by now, I think no one is disputes that at least uh, that inter, you know for at least for poor people credit markets are imperfect i, I think this is this is uh, taken as given question goes back to then understanding what what is it that uh, explains that and i told you gave you an example of one story which is what is called ex post moral hazard the borrower has incentive to not repay just make life difficult for for the lender um, this, this is, this is, uh, uh, yeah, 
this 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 is something that um, we already it's easy easy to see how how to model it we looked at that model but you could tell stories which are about ex ante moral hazard meaning the borrower thinks of ways in which he does things with the money that the lender wouldn't want him to do for example uh, you know if I take a big loan and put it in a lottery, uh, well, if, if I win the lottery, I'll repay. But if I don't win the lottery, I have nothing, I can't repay. Now, the lender one doesn't want you to do that because he knows that mostly you're not gonna win the lottery. So he would like you to take less risk and, and do a you know, more reasonable project. And that this particular tendency towards taking too much risk and, you know, Basically, once you default, you don't care about what happens since, you know, maybe it's the lender's loss. You, you don't internalize that. That particular argument uh, explains why there, there is sometimes ex, ex ante moral hazard. So that's a story that has been told. The, th the third story that's often told is adverse selection, meaning when I raise the interest rate, who do I attract? Into, bo into borrowing. Well, I attract those people who don't care about the interest rate. Who are the people who don't care about the interest rate? The ones who are really not planning to repay. So I end up with a lot of bad people or people who are one reason or another not going to repay. So that's the story of adverse selection. So I can't raise the interest rate because if I raise the interest rate, I would get the wrong kind of people. And that then creates a vicious cycle. Then since I'm going to get the wrong kind of people, I might want to raise the interest rate even more and so on. And so all of these are uh, arguments for why you might end up getting uh, situations where you know, some people pay very high interest rates or don't get a loan. Um, and notice these are all about the borrower misbehaving. And I'm, I'm going to try to argue later that my sense of, of what, uh, that that's maybe we were too obsessed with a borrower misbehavior. But I'll come back to that point. So it is a beautiful paper by uh, Dean Carlin and John Zinman on trying to test which of this is going on. And it's a it's a it's a field experiment with borrowers in a in a from a South African bank. They invited by mail to get a new loan. And the key thing that they are trying to do. So how do you know uh, whether you know? Remember a high interest rate, in principle, uh, if I, I offer you a high interest rate, you might want to default either because, you know, uh, that you might increase default either sort of uh, mechanically because with a high interest rate, I can't repay, uh, or it might be that it's because there's adverse selection uh, because there is a, that's what I call the repayment burden, or because there's adverse selection, that when the interest rate is high, uh, I, as I was suggesting, you attract all the wrong kinds of borrowers, the ones who don't have a plan to repay, or when the interest rate is high, uh, you attract people uh, who uh, you say that, look, you know, I really, this interest is absurd, I can't repay it, I'm going to try to figure out a way to not repay it, that's moral hazard. So, mm -hmm. Their idea was to design a way to separate these in an experiment to, to see what, to show, look at the effects of the higher interest rates, but in a way that gives you an understanding of which of these mechanisms are going on. So what they do, this is sort of a clever idea, um, very clever idea, I think has been used extensively since. One is where you can vary um, the rate they're actually offered. Okay, in the letter, you send them a letter saying, you are offered a new loan at this rate. And some people will take it. And if that rate, you can randomize that rate. And if that rate is higher, you might worry that you're going to get adverse selection. In particular, how do you separate that from, from moral hazard? Well, moral hazard depends not on the rate you were promised that made you come into the bank to get that loan, but the rent you actually get. So you could randomly say, look, in fact, I'm going to be nice to you and I give you a lower rate than I promised you. And that's going to create um, so variation conditional on the rate that attracted you into the bank. I could still vary the rate that you actually pay, make it lower. So in particular, there would be variation. You know, they managed to induce both variation in the rate you, you were promised that made you come in. That's sort of the adverse selection and the rate that you 
actually pay, which, gener which is the one that generates moral hazard. Because you know the rate you were, once you come into the bank, what matters and you get your loan, what matters is the loan you actually have. So this is the that's the uh, the contract rate. The offer rate is the one you are promised. Contract rate is the rate you actually get. And finally, um, the worry was that with a contract rate, with a higher contract rate, sometimes mechanically makes you want to default. And what they're interested in is this question, does a higher, higher interest rate actually distort incentives? And that's the reason why you, can, uh, you end up with these distortions in the credit market where people, you know, you, you, you don't raise the interest rate because uh, people, that will have bad effects uh, like in, like in our in our model uh, ex post moral hazard model, you instead of raise, raising the interest rate, you ration credit. You don't give people credit, or you give them very little credit. Uh, that then interacts with interest rates. That's what we were discussing about when we said, talked about the multiplier effect. But certainly, it is uh, you know you you would worry about whether or not uh, the question they're interested in is is there an incentive effect? Is it the case that high interest rates make generate misbehavior. That was, of course, at the core of our uh, ex post moral hazard model. It would be a core of the adverse selection model as well. But the, the worry is that in the data, how do you know that it's because I misbehaved or just because I couldn't repay? You know, higher the interest rate is harder it is for me to repay. If I don't make enough money, I can't repay because I don't have enough money. So how do you separate them? Well, they change. So for the people who had the same offer rate and the same same uh, contract rate, they offered some of them a potential loan at the same interest rate in the future so that they would actually now say, look, you know, maybe if I repay this loan, I get another loan. So that, that, that was a direct incentive effect, which by itself had no effect on their incentives in the current, they by itself had no effect on their ability to repay. The interest rate is the same, I'm paying 6%, uh, and I, if I can repay, uh, so if, if that's high for me, I can't repay. Uh, but the two people like that, one both facing 6%, but one of them is offered another loan if he does repay. So his incentives to repay are different. His current rate is the same. So current for the same contract rate, different people offer different length of the contract. So you have three different of uh, instruments here, and you can see how that affects default. Uh, that's the experimental design, if you like. Uh, there are people who have high offer rate, high contract rate, high offer rate, low contract rate, uh, low offer rate, and they don't raise the interest rate, so there's no high contract rate, but low con uh, offer rate, uh, low, uh, low contract rate, and then, and in fact, there are multiple layers, so they can vary actually. Um, multi, even within law, they can vary the interest rate. And then there are some people who have dynamic incentives. If they repay, they get higher, uh, another loan. So what they find strikingly, and I, you know, you can look at the table the table quickly if you have uh, if you're, uh, if you're a good enough screen, um, is that uh, basically the contract rate really doesn't matter. And the offer rate really doesn't matter. They really don't find much. Um, so neither of the, the incentive effects we expected, I mean, they're sort of uh, maybe uh, there, but the default is not higher. Now, what they do find is that if I promise you another, another loan, uh, you do default less and substantially less, but default in general isn't that high. It's, um, you know, 9% and out of that you, you get a 2% reduction, but it's not, the 2% the reduction suggests that there is some incentive effect, but the incentive effect uh, is sort of, upper, you know, it's not that we, we are getting huge variations in the, in, in the repayment rates, even out of that. So that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's I think, a, a good summary of, of what they find. Now you might worry about various things. You might worry that maybe the original lenders who were selected were, you know, too too well behaved, and therefore they, you know, because the bank had already chosen them to be good clients, and maybe they were too well behaved, and they were not subject to 
any of these incentive effects by 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 the bank selection, but uh, it, it it didn't generate a overwhelming proof that borrowers are misbehaving a lot, and that's what's causing causing the uh, the defaults and the incentive effects are very strong. And these are the, the interest rate they were offered were huge. They were like the variation was between you know four four percent per month and eleven percent per month. So the, the the variation was enormous. So it was not those are enormous interest rates. So there's not that there wasn't went obvious incentive effects uh, potentially. So somehow the theory didn't get us where we wanted. I'll stop there. Okay, so we have a question from Vic. Uh, what is your comment on progressive interest rate as when you pay interest proportionally according to income? Could this help low income families? Surely it could help low income families. The reason why it's not used more is income is hard to measure. And lenders I've talked to really do, the reason why they prefer a loan contract is because then I don't need to know what your income is. You prepay uh, whatever your income is. I there is lots of both you know, equity and efficiency gains potentially from having some kind of insurance built into it, which is what this kind of contract uh, does. And you do see some evidence of that. Chris Udry's uh, wonderful work from uh, Northern Ghana from many, many years ago shows, for example, that many of the loan contracts have an insurance component. So basically, if you are do very badly, I don't, you don't have to repay your loan. So that that that's a kind of an example of that, and I do think that 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 has attractive properties. And but it seems like it's only possible maybe when the bank, the lender, is someone who knows you very well and knows that it, you didn't on purpose screw up your income. Uh, otherwise, I don't and 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 knows that you when when you are really in trouble, he knows that. If he, if he or she doesn't know that, it's very hard to do it. So I think that clearly that would be a a good idea in some context, but for the banker to know whether you're, what your income is, and if you come and claim that your, your income is much lower than it is, how does he find out? So that, that's the reason why bankers are reluctant to do it. Um, the next question is from Saheed. Do you think information access could influence the monitoring cost? Yeah, I think information access would improve the, uh, could change the, so if, if there was a way, I think, the, in general, I think the claim that you know within uh, kin groups or within within families, the lending patterns are, you know, the interest rates are lower and that the lending patterns are very different is true. And probably part of that is information. Part of that could also be just altruism. I'm I'm okay with bailing out my nephew because he's my nephew, but I suspect some of that's the information. I really do know when he needs the money. And so I, th I think that information does help, but it, it's, it's not cheap. The information is not cheap. It's uh, credible information. So if I'm, if, it's, if I'm lending to my nephew, I have credible information. But if I'm lending to my you know, third cousin once removed, I may not have the same kind of information. Um, and the next question is from Ernie is, in that model, are we assuming no collateral? If not, why is the fault a concern if the lenders attach collateral to the loan they offer? So we are not assuming, in fact, we are assuming perfect collateral in a sense that we've gone the other way. We're assuming that the money that the borrower puts into the, so typically uh, the reason why collateral is different from wealth is because uh, somehow your wealth is not, uh, is not easily used for investment. I will assume that it's completely liquid so you can use it for your investment. So you only need to borrow the difference. In fact, in the real world, uh, what happens is I have a house, but I need to live in it. So I can't use it to, I can't sell it and generate the capital and buy my business. I then mortgage my house and raise a loan. But that, that means that I have a, uh, I'm not using my own money. And instead what I'm doing is I'm offering my house as a surety against repayment. So in a sense, I'm, as, I'm going the other way. That model is one where, uh, the house is perfectly and costlessly co collateralizable, and therefore, in a sense, it's like wealth. Um, it's it's it, it, the assumption is 
I have perfect, I mean, anything that makes it even harder is going to make the problem even more complicated. So I, if my house is not liquid, then, you know, the, then a whole question of eviction and all those things come, come in. I think we can take these questions from now and we can take the rest. Okay. So, what, so what else could it be? Why, why are there all these constraints? And I'm going to say that part of it is just that the, in fact, a lot of the lending comes from, uh, comes from people who are, who are not uh, lending their own money. Okay, that, that's going to be, so in other words, I want to move the problem of credit markets from the borrowers inside the lenders. The lenders, so it's not the case that most of the lenders are lending their own money. They are actually lending, you know, someone else's money. They're taking deposits or they're, they have, you know, investors who give them money to, uh, you know, to repay, uh, to, to, to invest. Uh, and, uh, you know, as, as, as a loan finance. And so, uh, the, you know, banks, for example, get deposits from people like me and relend them. Now this creates a different uh, set of issues which have little to do with the same, uh, you know, the borrowers misbehaving and much more to do with the concerns uh, the, of, of the bank itself. So in particular, uh, you know, I, when I gave, put my money, money in the bank, I'm on full safety. That's why I'm willing to take a low interest rate, but full safety to, you know, and partly uh, I want full safety and the government also wants me to have full safety because when, when banks default, typically governments have to bail out the, the, the savers and that happened in 2009 in the US, for example, a lot of savers had to be bailed out. And so when, when, when banks go into the red, that's costly for the government. So the government actually is regulates banks heavily. So that means that banks are really very mindful of trying to prevent default. However, on the other hand, banks, the problem with banks being large, which is what makes them easier to regulate and you know more, 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 more visible and therefore maybe less, less subject to, you know, so the government is more willing to deal with them. Um, is that they being large, they, the lending is done by loan officers and the loan officers don't need to be uh, all well disposed towards the bank. They are, they're working for the bank, but they have their private incentives. And many of them would love to lend to their friends or the family or just to themselves and default. And that way they won't, you know, the money will vanish. And it happens a lot. Uh, we know that it happens a lot. There are a lot of, um, lot of uh, default, uh, and in particular, loan officers often have to decide on amounts that are many times their salaries, many, many times. So they really have, uh, you know, the, so the banks can't really give them positive incentives. They can't give them incentives to say, say you know, that are based on um, success of the loan very much because, you know, the, the loans are $25 million. I'm making $25,000, uh, you know, so even if, and you know, there's no way to really give me incentives. In one percent of of twenty five million dollars is already my annual salary. So it really is uh, is not possible. So they rely a lot on negative incentives and uh, regulations. So you are not allowed to lend to X. You have to get this permission to be allowed to Y, uh, etc. And uh, you have particularly. And if the loan goes bad, you lose your job or you go. You, you're really punished in India, you can even go to jail because a lot of the gov government banks treat default as a potentially a legal uh, a criminal offense on the part of the, of the uh, loan officer. So people, so that means that some people are, some people uh, say, okay, look, I'm, I, I don't know, I'm going to be, therefore I'm going to be very risk averse. I don't want to lend to anyone who could possibly de default uh, I'm because all I get is the downside. If my, if my loan succeeds, I get very little. If, but if it goes uh, bad, then I'm really in trouble. I might end up in jail. So that's some uh, been in India. Uh, that this is also sort of a lazy banking. You follow the rules very carefully. You don't use soft information. You might know that this is a good guy or a good firm, but 
you know, what happens if it goes wrong? So I, I really don't want to take any chances. I want to, new people are particularly risky because I don't know anything about them. Why would I take a decision if I could avoid it? On the other hand, the other side of that is that, however, the incentive, because it comes from the downside, from default, is that sometimes when the loan goes bad, you want to hide that. And there's a tremendous amount of this going on uh, in many countries and it's been written about extensively. So lo what lo one way to stop revealing that is to actually give them, a, so suppose I took a hundred dollars and I'm about to default, you go, you're the banker, you come and say, okay, I'll give you two, 300. You pay me hundred back, so you repaid the loan. And then with the 200, you can try to make money and repay your loan. So I give you a bigger loan precisely because you behave badly or you had a bad outcome. And so you, you, you uh, and maybe uh, what well, the incentive is that maybe you'll succeed in this time and therefore you'll repay the loan. So I won't have to deal with the fact that some loan went bad or it might be that I will eventually pass on my portfolio to someone else and that person so they become that person's problem. And if I can steal the money that becomes even more tempting because you know, I, I could, I could ask the bank, uh, the firm for a, you look, I'll give you another loan, but now this time, you know, you default on the last one, this one I'm going to a bigger loan, but now you give me 10% of it. Uh, this is called evergreening, meaning you keep greening the loan, pretending it's a, gray, a green rather than red, but then that generate, and you end up giving big loans to bad investors. Uh, I'm going to show you first some data from uh, a single bank, uh, these are loan decisions from their files, and what what is this this uh, these are this is really saying what fraction of the loans as a bank in India what fraction of the loans the granted limit stayed the same so it was sixty six percent meaning that's every you know you were not given an ex a bigger loan next year sometimes seventy six percent now this is a period where you know, the inflation, it's uh, was, uh, you know, something like eight, nine percent. And therefore, these are times when, you know, the uh, real value of loans was shrinking at eight, nine percent. So, you know, the fact that you didn't get an extension means your loans are going down. Now, this was not because you didn't use the loan. Uh, you know, in most of these years, between three quarters of the loans had re reached the limit. So you had, a lend you had a borrowing limit, but you had actually used all of it. And in fact, under the bank's rules, uh, the maximum authorized limit is what the bank says based on your profits, et cetera, you should get. In fact, you're in most of the cases, again, three quarters of the cases in many of the years, you're, uh, you, you would have been entitled to a bigger loan, but you didn't get it. Uh, your predicted sales has gone up, your actual sales has gone up, uh, you know, any of the, in all of those things, uh, you, you know, everything that sort of measures performance, you're doing better, at least in nominal terms, um, but in fact, you don't, you, do, you, you, and this is relative to the bank's own rules, you still get less. So it's not just that the bank's rules are binding, you get even less than what the bank's bank had promised you. Uh, under its own rules. So this is evidence in prima facie evidence that the loan officers are being pretty conservative. Um, this is an, a related fact, which is that the, those who do get an increase, that seems to be uncorrelated with either past usage. So, you know, uh, yes, uh, you utilize it, you had used all of it or not, no doesn't seem to make any difference whether you got an increase, uh, whether your projected sales increase doesn't seem to have much to do with whether your limit was increased, uh, whether your actual sales has gone up has almost nothing to do with whether your limit was increased, uh, your profit went up, that has nothing to do with whether, whether your loan was increased, et cetera. So it's, it's really consistent with this view that you try to not uh, lend whenever you can. You just, you know, and where, when do you have to lend? Well, part of those people might be people who you really trust and are good, but some of those people are people who are going bad, whose loans are going bad, and you learn, lend to them. So when you increase, it's not because their profits or the sales went up, but because precisely because they're performing badly. That's why the correlation with profits or sales is pretty low. 
So if you, I, I want to show you some evidence from a very nice paper by Hertzberg, Liberty, and Paravicini uh, that, that that's exactly on this question, are there agency problems in the bank? And so the, the story they tell, it's from data from Argentina, they think of a loan that was bailed out, or at least at the more generally, if a, suppose I gave a loan because let's say they gave me a bribe uh, to, to a firm that should not have got a loan. Now, I, the problem that they, uh, for me as the loan officer when I did that is that uh, the, the bank every three years transfers a large fraction of its loans to another loan officer. So it goes from loan officer A to loan officer B. Now, loan officer A, um, B has different incentives from loan officer A, and that's where it's going to get interesting. So now think about what it would take. Suppose I gave a loan to somebody who didn't deserve it, either to bail it out or because he gave me a bribe, bribe or something. Well, I'm going to claim he's a great firm, so I'm going to give him a very high rating at the point where I give him the big loan. And now, now suppose, uh, but I know that when the loan over officer takes over and observe the history of what happened and can infer the borrowers, he can probably figure out that this is what I was doing because the, he looks at the firm and says, yeah, it's not making any money. It's really bleeding uh, capital. Why would you give him a big loan? So therefore I need to build the story that no, yes, I when I gave him the loan, it was great, but then it's, it's ratings. I want to change his ratings because if it turns out that the new guy comes in and he cuts the ratings uh, when it uh, you know, says that this firm is bad, then my boss will find out and say, look, why did you call it a one? And my, the next guy calls it a three, something fishy is going on. So I want to smooth out. So what I do is I, I, when I give him the loan early in my tenure, I actually give him a, 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 a good rating. And then when I take it, when I, I know that I'm gonna lose the loan, to someone else, I make his rating kind of go bad so that I'm convergent with the new, new guy. Um, so, so what happens, that means that the ratings when given are uh, would be really un, not very good at predicting borrower performance because a lot of bad guys get it. But by the time I hand it over, it's much more, much more predictive. This is sort of what they look at. It is, they use the bank, Argentine bank data. In the bank data, uh, loans are supposed to get transferred every three years. And they find that the ratings crash at the end of that period, exactly as you pr would predict. And the predictive power rises. So this is just showing that this is what happens. At 36 months, the probability of the, what's on the horizontal axis is month. On the vertical axis, probability of loan officer rotation. So you, your probability of it being rotated away from you is pretty low till 36 months, and it goes up quite a bit, then it comes down again, but it stays higher. So knowing that, what you should try to do is you should, um, you know, the, the predictive power, which is on the, in the, uh, in the uh, next graph, the predictive power is what's graphed and the, the, what's around it are the significance bands. The predictive power is really zero in the middle quarters, but much higher later. You're much more. So in other words, when I give you a big loan in the middle of my tenure, I often give it to bad guys. And therefore the rating I give it is always good. And when to anybody I give it, therefore, I, you know, those guys are, the ratings are meaningless. By the time I exit, the, the, uh, the, rate, the ratings are much more informative. Uh, and the level of the ratings as well. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to think, uh, describe these firms as being low, low ratings means good. Uh, I'm going to say that they are low risk firms in the middle of my tenure, but high risk by the time I exist. So you see exactly the pattern the theory predicts. And indeed, consistent with, with what the story I was telling, if you, what this graphic, this, this, uh, this uh, table shows is that if I give you, um, if I don't adjust my ratings. So in fact, the ratings were high and it was adjusted down by the next guy. 
I lose 50% or so of my portfolio. So I'm really punished. I, I get fired most of the time, half of some of the time, et cetera. So it's really disastrous the, for me to, you know, 70% of the debt I'm handling goes away from me. Uh, so that's the fourth line in that table is saying, if I were, if I failed to adjust the ratings and the next guy comes and adjusts the rating, this is just a correlation, but that correlation is very revealing. So just to summarize that what this is saying is that, uh, you know, and every, all the other numbers, if you, if you want to look at the paper, are just saying that, you know, you adjust your ratings exactly as we predicted, which is that, you know, your ratings are really good when you give them the loan. And by the time you exit, the ratings are much worse. Okay, I'm going to take a, so in other words, there is prima facie evidence or better than primary evidence, pretty convincing evidence that you see this cycle, this, you know, uh, at 36 months. Uh, so this is using the fact that the variation in this bank is sort of every three years you get replaced. So at 36 months, you do see, you expect to be replaced and therefore you, you start to fix your behavior. And you, when you're far from that, you misbehave. When you're close to that, you don't. And that's, that's consistent with uh, the theory that there's really big incentive problems within the bank. We'll take questions. Um, we have a question from Abdul Razak. So are there examples of studies that examine the causal evidence of moral hazard and or adverse selection in credit markets on constraining agricultural technology adoption? You know, I think, I wish there were, I think there, there are, Things like uh, what happens if I provide you with a, a grant and uh, does that increase uh, technology adoption? And the evidence is surprisingly mixed. So there is, a, I think, a very nice paper by uh, Carlin, Oze, Udry, and someone else. I'm really sorry uh, for forgetting the name of the fourth person uh, in Ghana showing that, uh, that in fact, uh, getting a grant does, has small effects on, you know, I think on chemical purchase of chemicals, but doesn't change the technology very much. But there are others who find more uh, positive results. So it's a bit mixed, but the way to, they don't really look at the question of whether if uh, moral hazard constraints, it just says, if I manage to give you a grant, then what happens? And that's more, that's a kind of a very limited way. It's a grant is a kind of a way to increase the wealth in our model and therefore, and a wealth is a substitute. You know, once you have more wealth, then you have less incentives to default because you're putting your own money into it. And there, and so it's kind of a substitute for a loan. So, the, but I, I haven't seen anyone do what you're suggesting, which is a study, if I can, manipulate the extent of moral hazard, do I really see credibly, uh, credible evidence that the technology changes? I, I, I like that question. Um, the next question is from Jose. Could the threat of politicians regulating interest rates exposed with some kind of ceiling be a restriction to high interest rates in practice? You know, I, 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 don't, I assume that the, the in general politician, I mean, there is, a, there is a nice work on this on election cycles and how lending changes. And I think the evidence suggests that you do get worse loans in election years. There's a nice paper by Sean Cole on that. So yeah, I think politicians intervening in it creates complicated things. You might get more loans, but worse loans. Um, the last question that we have, I think is just referring to something that you said previously in the lecture, but usually from whom do people borrow from? If they borrow from relatives, is it difficult to impose high interest rates? So, yeah, so that's, a, that, that's an excellent question. And you, you, relatives have a very good uh, uh, advantage in lending to you. They might be more altruistic, so they may not care so as much about default, and they may have better information about you. On the other hand, they are very... I mean, most poor people's relatives are also poor, so they don't have much capital. And second, they worry that uh, precisely that, you know, uh, they don't, they, they, do, they feel, feel bad about raising the interest rate. So maybe they, they actually don't lend as much as they would 
like? So, you know, sometimes altruism cuts both ways. That's a good question. I think we're going to take these questions from now. Okay. So for the last uh, 10 minutes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, uh, so I, all of this is to say that, you know, uh, if the if a big part of the problem is with, you know, large lenders, then do we see the problem, the same kind of, you know, credit constraints uh, appearing for la the clients of larger, you know, lenders or banks? So these are large firms. These are not not the minor school uh, firm. You know that uh, a lot of the first evidence I show you were on informal lending, and a lot of those were you know fruit sellers who borrowed for the their working capital for the day. These are much, 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 much bigger firms, and uh, so. And I'm going to use the fact that there was a program in India which uh, which uh, changed access to basically subsidized bank credit, and we'll look at the effect of that on on uh, the F, on the firms that they they lend to. So. The fact, uh, so uh, how do we know whether a firm is credit constrained? Well, we need to, ideally we'd know their marginal, if they knew their marginal product capital, of course we could calculate whether they are, you know, is higher than the interest rate, but that's, that's a bit pie in the sky, marginal product capital itself, you need some variation to estimate it, how do you estimate it? So um, one way to think about it is that Indian banks uh, are required, have this priority sector lending uh, lending uh, requirement. So the, they have to lend 40% of their portfolio to the priority sector. Uh, in January, 1998, uh, that limit of what consists of priority sector firms, uh, so was changed from you know, 6.5 million rupees to 30 million rupees. That was uh, then, so some firms that were not previously eligible became eligible for these subsidized loans. Then that limit was, but there were some protests and that then was lowered back to 10 million. So there were two experiments in a sense, an expansion experiment and a contraction experiment. And we want to look at the effect of becoming newly eligible or ineligible on, on your performance. Now, a problem that uh, I want to use, uh, quickly plant some vocabulary problem that when you have subsidized lending, then of course, you know, subsidized lending is maybe I want the subsidized loan. So it's not the case that I'm, uh, you know, just the fact that when I offer you subsidized lending, I, you, I expand my output. That's not evidence that you're credit constrained because it's subsidized. So what, in a sense, think of thinking about this, what, what, given that if some firm faces multiple interest rates, some subsidize, some not, then what matters is at the, the highest rate the firm pays, the market rate, if you like, is the firm able to borrow as much as it wants? And if it does, then it's not credit concerned, it's rationed because it can't get as much subsidized credit as it wants, but that's the nature of subsidized credit. So, so we want to know, and this that's what this slide says, I, I won't spend too much time on it. Uh, so, to distinguish between credit ration and credit constraint firms, we, we want to look at whether or not the firms that, uh, when you get subsidized credit, the difference between ration firms and, so ration firms can borrow as much as they want at the market rate, they're not constrained. Therefore, if I increase subsidized credit, what they should do is they say, look, I'm borrowing at the market rate that's higher, so I should just, I, I can borrow as much as I want, so I'm not constrained, but I could subsidize, sub, substitute market credit by, my, uh, my, by the credit I get from, the, from, the, uh, from the, the subsidized credit, cheaper credit. So what the optimal thing to do, unless I have no market borrowing, is to substitute, because you know, I'm, I'm already borrowing as much as I want, I just want it cheaper. On the other hand, if, it is, if you are really constrained, then you should use the credit because you really want more credit. You don't, you're not, you're not getting enough. So it makes a difference whether or not you have any residual borrow, market borrow. So what we're going to look at is the effect of getting access to this 
and see if it's different between firms that have zero market borrowing for which, you know, they, who should be using the subsidized credit to expand uh, because at that point, the subsidized credit is their marginal rate at the marginal rate and ones which do have market borrowing and those should, should just substitute. That's what credit ration firms should do. If you're really credit constrained, what you should do is actually expand. And it doesn't matter whether, you know, if you have market borrowing or not. Uh, and a, a more general way to say it is that uh, the ones who have uh, market borrowing, um, no, uh, sh if they're credit rationed, then, you know, credit should go off faster than sales because most of that money will go into repaying some market debt and just getting cheaper credit. So you're going to use less of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the following empirical exercise. We're going to look at the, the growth in credit, revenue, profits, et cetera, and compare what we call big firms with small firms. Big firms are firms that uh, used to be ineligible and become eligible or become used to be eligible and become ineligible uh, and uh, post is after the change in the eligibility. What we're going to look at, we're going to use the fact that it turns out that big post is uncorrelated probability of enforcement. This is sort of goes back to what I was saying before, which is that banks are very strange objects. They don't seem to respond to obvious things. So who gets these extra loans? When, when what happens is that when you make these firms eligible, some of them do get uh, extra loans, but it's not the case that most of them do. Most of them still don't get an extra loans. Uh, but when you get an extra loan, you do get a much bigger one. And that's, that's the variation we will use. So first, first striking fact is that if you look at the OLS, the, just the correlation between change in, in grow, growth in sales, et cetera, and getting credit, that's zero. So, uh, I mean, I meaning there's no correlation between, if you get more credit, you don't get more uh, revenues, but that that might be because either because there is no need for extra credit, or because there might there is bad guys are getting some of those loans. Why? Because of the uh, you know the uh, bailout argument I was making before, for example. Now, the, what the policy shock does is it isolates a particular form of variation uh, with the policy shock. Uh, I'm I'm getting uh, a bigger a bigger loan. Uh, uh, a bigger loan, but that bigger loan is going to be uh, going to particular firms. The bigger loan is going to firms that are, um, and, you know, the bad guys, the ones I need to bail out, I still already have to bail out. So I don't give them the extra money. If I have to give a bigger loans, I'm going to give it to guys who, who actually are hungry for the money. So I might actually give it to the good guys. And we do find that credit to big firms grows faster in the uh, bigger, the post period, no change in the interest rate. And as I suggested, the key diagnostic is that sales grows as fast as credit. So they're not paying down loans, they're absorbing the credit. If, you, if your credit goes up by X percent, your sales goes up by X percent. Um, so in particular, let me show you the, uh, so the, sorry, I'm going to actually, I didn't notice, but the, uh, the, the table got cut off on the right. Uh, my, my fault, but in any case, you, I would probably not have very many minutes for you to look at it. So let me just summarize. Basically, if you look at the firms that got an increase in limits, uh, you do see an increase in their profits, increase in the sale, all proportional to that. Profits actually goes up faster than, uh, than the, uh, the, the, the credit, which is consistent with the view that they have a fixed cost and therefore, you know, once I give you extra money, you can expand and that your profit goes up actually faster than your sales. So sales goes up about in proportion with credit and profit goes up about twice as fast. So you, this suggests a very high elasticity of, of uh, profits. It's an elasticity of 1.8 with respect to credit. So your profit actually goes up much faster. And if you do the dot the I's and cross the T's, you get a marginal product of capital, which is close to 100%. So this, this is really 
saying that even for these very large firms, which these are the formal sector firms who are you know, big firms, the margin products of some of these firms is very high. Others, as I said, the OLS is zero. So some of the firms are really bad and they have very low margin product, but at least there is prima facie evidence that the marginal product is not equalized. So some, some of these firms are really starved of credit. The good firms are starved of credit. Maybe the bad firms are getting too much of it. So I'm, I'm going to uh, stop here uh, and, uh, the, and I'm, I'm sort of done I, uh, what I want. So just to summarize, uh, there is evidence that even among very large firms, uh, who are clients of banks, so not, not tiny firms at all, firms which have you know, more than $200,000 of paid up capital. The, these kinds of firms uh, are also credit constrained, not all of them, some of them might have too much credit because of bailouts, others have too little, but the allocation of credit even among big firms is a problem. And I, I would suggest that that is a lot to do with the incentive problems inside the banks. I stop there. Um, we have a question from Drove. Uh, what's the evidence on the effect of bank expansion, formal credit, on informal firms' credit situation? Does this change only if there are complementary local economic developments, such as increased market access due to roads? So there's evidence. So I mean, this is again a little bit uh, understudied. I would say the bank expansions, uh, but for example, there is a uh, paper by Rohini Pandey and Robin Burgess uh, from many years ago is showing that when India uh, enforced expansion of, of banks to rural areas, so forced banks to open branches to rural areas, that reduced poverty, that, you know, that, that reduced uh, improved access to credit among the people who really needed it. So this, this it's not again wonderful. The, uh, I mean, the micro, so then there's the evidence on microcredit. The, and what microcredit is interesting, much of the evidence in microcredit is a bit um, mixed in the sense that, um, you know, the, that while you see, you know, high uptake of the loans from in many cases, the effect on poverty is hard to detect. What you actually find is kind of the opposite, which is some people who were, are big or are relatively you know, entrepreneurial among the microcredit clients uh, actually expand, uh, expand their output and profits and, and, and actually benefit substantially from it. But it's the average person, their poverty doesn't seem to change. Their businesses don't really change either. We have actually answered all the questions that we had. Okay, great. Well, I, I thank everyone for attending this session and I will, uh, I will say goodbye then.